This was our home. We lived here. Hello and welcome to Comic Book Movie Oblivion, the podcast about feature films based on comic books and comic strips that people have stopped talking about. We are your hosts, Jordan and Kumar. That's me. And me. And this week we are talking about Here, which just came out this week. Indeed. This is the first time we've ever done this. We actually went to the cinema. I used a pen with a LED light on it to take notes. If there'd been anyone in that cinema, they would have been very grumpy. That's right. With very lucky. Pen. It was a very empty <laughs> cinema on this movie's first week of release. There were like two other people there and they were way down in front. Pause the podcast. Well, since it's a movie that's out in the cinemas, we should say, I suppose, pause the podcast if you plan to go and see this film. Yes. Uh, however, I don't know. I don't... If you're don't, not planning to go and see it, I, I don't think there's really much of a plot to be no, spoiled. No, exactly. There's a few... No, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a plot. Well, that's not true. There is very definitely a plot, which, in it, contrast to the comic... There's specifically no plot. Deliberately, specifically, no plot in the comic. Whereas there is very definitely a plot in the film. Yes. Uh, there are a few very telegraphed... <laughs> There's lots of telegraphing going on in this movie. We'll talk Moments. about that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I would say... Um, wouldn't worry too much about pausing the podcast. Okay. Okay, so... we got to start with a little bit of background on Richard McGuire. Great. And Raw. Uh, so, Raw was a anthology comics magazine... Uh, which came out in the 80s. It came from 81 to 86. They did eight issues. Uh, it was edited by Art Spiegelman. Mm, of Mouse Of fame. Mouse fame. And he, he serialized Mouse in Raw. That's where Mouse first appeared. Okay. Right? He was a prize winner. And it was also edited by Francois Mouly, who is the art director at The New Yorker and is also ah. Spiegelman's wife. Yeah. And they had actually, for Raw Volume 1, Issues 1 to 8, they had actually brought a, like, a printing machine up into their apartment and were printing these magazines up there. And there was... <laughs> Amazing. It's very... Um, this was like an art magazine, right? So it was mm. very experimental. Uh, there were issues that, like, had um, a corner torn off in the top, and then they had taped in a corner from a different issue into each one, so they're all mismatched. Um, and like there was like an issue that came with like a flexi disc with some sort of music on it and like one had bubblegum and cards in it. Yeah. They did all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, it was not like the undergrounds of the 70s. In fact, Spiegelman had edited an underground magazine called Arcade in the 70s. That fell apart. Okay. And he wasn't going to get back into being an editor again, but then Francois Mouly convinced him to do it. So he started doing this raw. But whereas the undergrounds were like, uh, I guess, irreverent or counterculture or anti-establishment, raw was more about alternative, mm. experimental, avant-garde, art comics, Euro European comics. This is the only other venue other than heavy metal for European imports. Got it. Except these weren't like the sex and sci-fi comics. These were like the more serious European comics would end up, some of them would appear in... Uh, raw. Um, so then they did a second volume which ran from 89 to 91 which came in a much smaller digest size and these were actually pu published by Penguin. Yeah. So there was like more of a... it wasn't as handmade anymore. It was like a yeah. kind of a big... They look like movie. actual books and they, they haven't been mimeographed in someone's studio. That's apartment. right. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Um, so there were three issues of this version. They came out in 89 and between 89 and 91. Um, and Richard McGuire's comic here appeared in issue number one, uh, which was in 1989, and it was six pages long. Yes. This comic. Um, six pages, I think six panels a page. Right that's about. right. That's mm. right. Uh, depending on how you describe it, <laughs> which we'll get to in a minute. That's a good point. I, I, yeah, all right. Okay. <laughs> I, yes, yeah. yes. Um, okay, so Richard McGuire was, if you read his, his bio in this issue of Raw, he's basically described as a musician as the founding member and bass player in the band Liquid Liquid. That's like how they describe him. He was apparently a street artist. Okay. Um, he sit, he's done barely any comics. He's done about six comics. Uh, Raw was one of them. Or sorry, Raw. Here yeah, was one yeah. of them. Um, he's like a printmaker, sculptor. He designs toys. He does kids' books. Wow. He's done animation uh, for some French studios. He's done like these short animation bits. Um, 
he was at, in 2006 he was working on some kind of sound sculpture as he called it where he had this de these devices that could beam sound directly into a certain to pinpoint certain locations and he was using this to create all sorts of stuff okay um, so he's this but this this tracks so he's a kind of avant-garde experimental artist yes because uh, here is very much I guess what you would call an experimental comic, absolutely isn't it yeah I mean it I, I I hadn't heard of it until you showed it to right. me but apparently it's quite famous Huge. yeah yeah it was a big deal when it came out it absolutely anybody who saw it in, you remember it yeah oh yeah absolutely it, was it like, makes a big impression when you first read it yeah you're like, what is this thing? This guy has broken comics apart <laughs> in six pages and reassembled it. He's yeah. figured it out. Yeah. He's worked it all out. He understands how it works somehow without being a comics artist. I think it was maybe the first comic he did. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to read this description. So in 2006, there was an interview with Richard McGuire in Comic Art Magazine number eight. And there was a little uh, appreciation of here written hmm. by Chris Ware, who's a giant of a cartoonist in his own right. Yes, his name pops up when you search, when you look up here in Richard Maguire as kind of like the big comics name that was influenced. Right. Or that, that telegraphs his debt, his artistic yes. debt to here. Yes. So I'm going to read his description of here because I was thinking about all week, I'm like, how are we going to describe this comic? It's so hard to describe. Yeah. And I've tried to explain to people over the years, and it's like, I don't know, you just got to read this thing. I can't describe it to you. Chris Ware has done an excellent job okay, of describing good, perfect. it. So I'm going to read this. It's a few paragraphs long. Uh, I won't read the whole thing, but it's, this is going to go on for a minute. He says, without just digressing too much into description, the strip is a history of one corner of a room spanning the years 500 billion BC and 2033 AD. The strip came out in 1989, remember? Yes. Told in six pages of six panels each, totaling 36 reader-friendly panels, or, more properly, 85 panels, because although the initial panels are clearly labeled 1957, by the fifth panel, 1957 is only a smaller part of the original image, having been reduced and reframed by a picture of the same room, but labeled and clearly refurnished as 1922. This simple, maddlingly obvious, and magically electrical metaphor for the very longing that is life passing into oblivion carries a strip forward through a parade of multi-generational oppositions that are at once trivial and poignant. One of the more infrequently considered aspects of the comic strip storytelling is the transparent present tense in which everything seems to happen, i.e. Mm. things literally seem to move before the reader's eyes. Those cartoonists who desire more literary seasoning to this effect may shake a little third-person narration over choice panels, casting everything back into a simulation of past tense or memory. But beyond these two choices, and before here, there had been very little experimentation into the narrative tense of comics, which is really the concern for where exactly it is that the reader's consciousness is in a strip, if I can say this without sounding too erudite. A fundamental technical oddity of comics is that space is sliced up into paper-thin views of experience, visually spread out in rows, tiers, or whatever compositional arrangement most clearly indicates linearity, and then life breathes back into it all by the peculiar and rather complicated act of reading. Such re-representation of time in comics is also traditionally arranged with an implicit direction of past to present, which generally directly corresponds to the direction of reading in the cartoonist's narrative culture. For us Westerners, it's from left to right. With here, however, Richard takes space, slices it into pictures, and then shuffles it all up, past, present, and future, hopelessly intermingled, taking time out of the page and placing it squarely back into the conscious consciousness, and more importantly, the control of the reader. The uninitiated viewer doesn't realize this trick at first, but as soon as that fifth panel is reached with the 1922 surrounding it, we have to look back, we reread, and before we know it, we've gone back in time both narratively and of our own volition. By the second page, we will likely have already flipped back and forth a good number of times, recognizing certain characters suddenly aged, then youthful, then aged again, yet all held in frame by the single idea that this is all happening, or has happened, or will happen, in one corner of the same space, or here. People move around, give birth, laugh, spill water, and die, but the room stays the same. In here, space and time work in the mind of the reader in a way that's closer to real memory and experience than anything that had come before in comics. Right? Mm. That's basically the size of it. So, to pitch, to describe it, which is a bit like um, that quote about trying to dance about architecture, um, the way this comic works is, when you get to the fifth panel, every panel before this is mostly set in 1957. We get a caption box that tells us that. 
But once you get to the fifth panel, imagine if you have your uh, computer desktop Compu open. The computer analogy is, is opposite yeah. because apparently uh, McGuire was uh, inspired by uh, desktop windows. Right. So a, a very new kind of concept yeah. at the time. Yeah. So as you say, you, you, you imagine you have a static view of a room and you had on your computer and you have some boxes that you can click and drag. Yeah. Maybe you can you can create some some boxes as well. You can draw them yourself. And each box has a time yeah. associated with it. You can move the boxes around yeah. and as you move them, they show that time. Yes. You so you're looking through like filters or windows. So you imagine so and the artist and author has he has chosen the windows that we see. But actually this lends itself so well to this computer kind of way of thinking about it that there is an app. Yeah. Did you you read about this? I didn't read this one. Yeah. There is an ebook. Okay. I didn't I didn't have time to look it up, but there's an ebook for iOS, okay. so an Apple app where you have here the story okay. and you are in charge. Oh. Whoa, this is interesting. Of ordering the panels and the order in which you read okay. it, which is similar to what you were just saying, yeah. the quote that you were just reading where it doesn't have a narrative per se. Instead, we just get these windows yeah. of time. Yeah. And, I mean, what is he trying... What's he trying... I mean, what is he trying to say? What's he trying to do? This is... Certainly, I mean, you, when you read it, I remember when I read it, I was just delighted. Yeah. yeah. That was what I remember. Delight. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it's shocking because the first you get the two panels. When you get to panel five, you get the inset of 20, 1922 right. happening inside of... Or say 57 is happening inside of 22. Yeah. But then you get to the panel after that, and the outside panel is in 1971 in the same space. 20, 57 is still happening. It's a split second in 57. This woman has asked for a baby bottle, and the baby bottle is given to her. Yeah. And then we get this cat in the bottom corner, and the cat, it says 1999. So this is 10 years after the comic strip is written. Yes. So the future. Important. The future. Important. Yes. Very important. And then we cut to the, we get to the next panel, which is 1940. It looks like a New Year's Happy New Year party. Yep. And the cat has now moved slightly across the bottom of the bot. Uh, we, see, own, we see the, the passage cat's in his of own the cat. Panel in 1999. And then we start getting three or four insets within each panel, and each one is a different year. And then sometimes, then we start seeing cows, like cows and like farm animals yep. out there in Because they're fields. In, the, in the 19th century. Yep. So this was a farm in the 19th century. Yep. Finally, we get a, you know... A, on the third page, we get a panel which includes 100 million BC. There's dinosaurs roaming around, yep. the Stegosaurus. It's a Stegosaurus. Not, I mean, this is probably on the east coast of America. It's not the right place for a Stegosaurus. But they were yeah. They were in America, I'm so that's okay. not sure where this is set, actually. It's not really Well, clear. the 2014 one's very clearly on, on, in the, Ameri on the American east right. coast. Because we see William Franklin's house. Ben Franklin, the, yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's William Franklin. That's right, yeah. William Franklin. Yeah. And, um, but, yeah, so... As, as you say, you, we we have sort of like the broad. Generally, we have like a, a, a um, an Uber panel. Yeah. One of the six on the page, and within that, lots of little ones showing all of these different times. Yeah. Things like cows wandering through, people, and yeah. uh, he, <laughs> some of them are incomprehensible. Yeah. There's one of a woman's like skirt flying yeah. up, and I'm like it. it Based on position, it's not a poster on the wall. Maybe it's a part and you flip back through. You're like, yeah. what else is happening at 56? You're trying to find other... I you're think, going back and forth all the time. You'd think you could use this to, I don't know, tell some nested stories. But that's not what Maguire is doing no. here. It, first of all, it's too short. Yeah. <laughs> it's only six pages. Yeah. Uh, second of all, I just I don't think that's what he's interested in. He's not interested in a narrative. This is, this is, there is no narrative here. No. Uh, instead... I think he what he mostly does is two things. Uh, he likes to um, be clever, so he'll do things like put the Stegosaurus in. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's just it's a. Or, you know, I don't think it's just cleverness because actually the thing that hits me about this comic every time I read it is, this is how I look at the world, and maybe it's because of, I've been reading all these works of psychogeography by Alan Moore. <laughs> we can ring the bell for that. Mm -hmm. um, Please do. We have to ring the bell. We have to ring the bell for that. Uh, but, like, we just moved in this house, and I'm thinking about the people who lived here before. 
and I'm thinking about was somebody ever standing on the same place having a similar conversation to the one I'm having? And I'm thinking about what was here before these fields were raised. Um, who, which tribes were walking over this place? What's going to be here a hundred years from now? Which is comes up in this comic. We have f flashes yeah. to the future. We get the house burning down. Very we important. get some kind of space age stuff with people wearing weird clothes. A yeah. guy comes back to visit yeah. the place. In 2027, he yeah. comes back and says, I lived in this house yeah. 50 years ago or whatever. Yeah. And we get some weird ritual where these people are burying some sort of capsule in the giant capsule in the ground in the year 2033. Yeah, I mean, it's not so distant. It's It like, looks like a time capsule. Yeah. They've uprooted a tree and put a time capsule in the hole where the tree was. Yeah. And then there's a brass band. So it's not, it's not the impossibly distant future. Yeah. It's, you know, six years from now. Yeah. <laughs> they still yes. have bus. But it's 1989, he's yeah. like, oh, what's happening? 20 People wearing strange clothes of and course. weird hats and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it's and that's future, something you think about now. Fashion. And I yeah. was to just today, I was listening to a podcast about the heat death of the universe, and I'm like, <laughs> You know, yes, well, well, okay, so the sun goes out in 8 million years or whatever, and what's going to be here? When will humanity be gone? And what's this place going to look like? And I think about all that kind of stuff. And Richard McGuire figured out the best way to do this is in comic form with these inset frames inside the panels. It seems like the best possible approach to represent thinking about the universe in that way. It's, it's very, that what I take away from it, similarly, it's just, I just think it's very clever. Yeah. Uh, that's, as I said, when I first, you first showed it to me a couple of weeks ago, you just got out that copy of Raw, showed me the comics, and I just thought, oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh my god, how can, how do you even come up with this? Yes. In 1989. Well, he'd, he'd seen an Apple Mac or something, and he'd seen the Windows, and that apparently inspired him. But even so, it's so, and he uses, he uses the, um, as I said, he doesn't use them to tell a story, he most, because there is no story, right? It's like you yeah. said, but it, it's just the, he does two things, I think. He he um, he winks at us by having funny juxtapositions. Yes. Things like the Stegosaurus saying "gur," like the Stegosaurus yes. saying "gur." Yes. Yes. Uh, Meanwhile, uh, in the same panel, there's an inset of a guy in 1986 with a funny hat on his head saying "ha ha ha." <laughs> yeah. And, and there's a mouse being caught in a trap in 1999. Yeah, yeah. There'll be bits where uh, he, someone's talking about the living room in one panel, and then we show the next of when the house was being built, and the bloke building the house saying, "This is where I'm going to put the living room." Right. Yes. So he's making these wry winks to us, like he's saying, look, here's the potential of this way of storytelling. Yeah. We can kind of do smash cut jokes. <laughs> yes. There's also sometimes there's like some parallels, like uh, when somebody's getting his photo taken in 1974, 64, 84, he puts them all in the same panel yep. with like three insets. Yep. Oh, I think it's very clever and very aware of it. Uh, the other thing it does, I think, uh, which I really like, is we see slices of humanity. Yes. So essentially, this is the human experience across time. We see people doing this. Is I think this one's even more uh, really, really kind of hammered in in the 2014 one, mm. which we'll get to. But we kind of just seeing like we have this place, this setting, the one setting that we see over and over. But we we see human beings kind of doing the same things. They do working, uh, celebrating. Uh, party, you know, f farming, leaving, coming and going, uh, dying, being born. Yeah. I, I think that's what I really like about, um, what I really like about it and which I, the thing that I think is, is thematically, I suppose, the most interesting about, the, yes. about it, the way that you can use this to show the verities of the human kind of condition. Yes. And, and makes you think about what has happened on the exact space you're standing in. Yes over millions of years that too that um too. and what will happen there over the next you know yep. millions of years yes because of course and this we can now talk about the uh the remake yes so as early as uh, there was an interview in comic art and this was from 2006 he was talking about how he'd been approached to do a book version right and he had kind of stalled on it a couple times because he wasn't sure how to approach it um so finally we get this 300 page version uh, yep. which is in color and done in um, like various art styles. Some of it's done with like watercolor, some mm. of it's done with color pencils. Different from the six pager, which is a consistent art style, yes. really, isn't it? Yep. Yes. There's another, I would say the big difference as far as, you know, a comic geek goes, is that the six pager is a page divided into six panels. Very much so, yeah. 
So it feels like a comic. It's a comic that's cut, chopped up. The comic page, as we traditionally read them, is already hacked up into a bunch of pieces, which we call panels or frames or boxes, whatever you want to yeah. call them. This one, every it's it's two page spreads. Yes. So it's, you're basically looking at so one panel every time we, you turn the page. We it's still one have panel. the the um. We still have the conceit or the effect where we have the boxes within. Yes. And they have the date in the top left corner, yes. the same way it did in the, in the uh, six page version. But here, the I guess the what I called the Uber panel earlier is just the double page spread. Yes. There, there is no panel. The, it's just a big, it's a big picture. That's right. Mm. That's right. Um, and I already, already reading, I mean, I read it online. I didn't have the book in my hands, yeah. but already I felt this was less like a comic already I, yes. th I thought and I find reading and much more like a picture book yes and reading the digital version has some very weird effects which I don't know if he planned for but if you're using your mouse wheel to scroll down there's almost some kind of animation effects where you've got the same screen or the same stage that you're looking at this fixed view yeah. which you do in the comics but you have to move your eye kind of from panel to panel in the comic or if you're reading the physical book version you have to flip the page here you got the mouse to it, so your eyes are static and things are kind of moving in front or these little inset panels which are all different shapes and sizes panels, yeah. are being are being replaced as if by magic or as if in a kind of animation so that's a different effect too um the thing that really hit me about this one is that you know sometimes something happens in 1957 and then 30 pages later, you get 57 again. That could be two months apart, or it could be a literal split second apart. Yeah. There's an amazing that We have some pages yes. where we, we see a year's worth of activity yeah. spread across multiple inset panels. Yeah. yeah. And there's one, there's one spread in the book version where a bird flies in a window, yeah. and you get, like, 20 panels that are all labeled 2007 of this bird chasing this girl around in her living room, yeah. in the room of here. So the bird is... Yeah, so we you know that's obviously that's not a year's worth of activity. That's no. a minute's worth. Yeah. But we're seeing the bird in all the different positions it would occupy in the room in that minute. And each one is its own inset that's labeled two thousand. Just so. Yeah. And against, but and the Uber panel is not even that year. Yeah. So it's another year, like uh, nineteen fifty or something like that. It's a dark room, and we're just seeing the bird kind of. Yes, and the girl, the girl trying to. Yeah. Yeah. I think shoot that's away. the main innovation of the of the uh, twenty fourteen remake i think is this showing events that are occurring yes. with uh, across time within a given yes. year and we get a bit more of um the effect like the smile get your picture taken which was one panel this we get more sequences of people with their like mothers with their babies over a, like a, a a very long sequence of years but each one will be on that one two-page spread or uh like people embracing is another one like yep. you might get some pages like that where most of the time you you're really trying to wrap your head around who was there what kind of furniture was in the room at that stage all kind of stuff and suddenly he will do the work for you and say, okay here's all these people at in a span of a hundred years who are embracing or holding their babies or yes. doing something like yeah, that this one again i get the real sense that um what we see here is look look at look yeah. at the look at the truths of human yes life yes here is what's important. In all in all these times, but the same place, people love one another. Yeah, they love. They have their yes. family. They they engage in these activities that give them meaning, like their their hobbies, their professions, their vocations. Yeah. Sure. I mean, because we have a static viewpoint, obviously the people in this space are going to be doing a lot of the same sorts of things because it's a living room. But I still feel like the kind of like the power of this. It's not even really storytelling or the power of this way of showing events side by side is to say, here's what's important. Yes. 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 I really love it. There's some, uh, there are, some, uh, there's a bit more sprinkling of narrative in the book version. True. So there's a, a Native American couple in like the 1600s that are having sex in the woods and they're kind of interrupted by some noise or something. I really like that. I mean, because they're just, they're sort of flirting. Yes. I like this because... Oh, yeah, she says, tell me a story, and he makes up this story uh, about this about guy... About the beast of the woods that, 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 that is unkillable and enormous. Yeah. And before it eats its prey, it likes to have sex with it. Yeah. And he's talking about himself. Yes, yes. <laughs> and that just feels like, you know, the temptation with... 
I suppose, with telling this kind of story would be to other the Native Americans. Yes. And say, look at how things have changed. Yes. In this spot. We have this one spot, but look at how things are different. No. You know, we have weird Native Americans mm -hmm. in the past. We have weird future people on the other end. And in the middle, we have normal people in the 20th and 21st centuries doing normal things. No. Yeah. Instead, what Maguire does is he says... Look at how normal everyone is at every point in this yes. narrative. Yes. The Native Americans are flirting the way like a yeah. like a like a guy like a kind of like maybe a, a high school or a young adult with mm -hmm. game mm -hmm. might <laughs> yeah. might come onto a girl. Yeah. And in the future, similarly, like it's the distant future, it's like the twenty three hundreds or something mm -hmm. like that, and they're still interested in what we're interested in. There it's like a museum exhibit. Yeah. They go, here there was a house on this site. Yeah. Uh, you know, they people wore wristwatches and yeah. Yep. And held wallets. They have to describe what wallets. a wristwatch is. What is a wristwatch? It's a piece of metal which would approximate the time and it yep. was attached by pieces of animal hide. Yep. And then they have to, they have to describe a wallet the same way because it's way from the This future. is an example of Maguire being clever. Yes. I mean, that's the other thing. That's his other great uh, indulgence with this style of uh, yeah. <laughs> comics writing. He loves to be clever. Yes. And I give full credit to him because he, he practically invented... The other thing is, it's almost like he invented a new way of telling stories. But the trouble is, and I'm extra readings, I feel like it becomes a little more obvious that it's a bit of a gimmick. The potential of this I've, way of breaking comics, brilliant as it is, yeah. is that there aren't really that many things you no, can you do can't, with you it. No, you can't emulate it. You can't, <laughs> you, nobody else can do it without being, oh, you're pulling a Richard Wire. Yeah. yeah, you're being derivative. It makes me think of, you know, like something like um, you know, an experimental novel. Like maybe something like Avoid, the mm -hmm. translation yeah. of the French novel, which doesn't have the letter E in it. Yeah. You could do your own version of Avoid, which doesn't have the letter A in it. Yeah. But you would just, it would yeah. be very obvious yes. that you were being... Yes. So it's, while it's kind of like a towering artistic achievement, it doesn't really have potential to tell a lot of different stories. Yes, I agree. It says everything it needs to say, which is actually why I kind of like the short version more than the book length I, version. I absolutely like the short I version. I do more. think the six Much more. Although, you know, it, there's some, it opens up some rooms, you know, no pun intended, with the full length because he's he's changed it a little bit in that in the six pager when the before the house is built we just see an empty field here there's a period where we see the houses across the street yeah. and we get another seed of a narrative about ben franklin there yeah. and his son who's living in this house across the street yeah. and there's a later on there's a moment where there's a halloween party and somebody's dressed as ben franklin at the halloween party but you don't know at this stage that ben franklin was william franklin was the guy that was living across the street that's not revealed until later yeah. and a lot of stuff isn't revealed until you don't know who a person is unless until much later in the book and then you have to flip back you have to flip back 50 pages and try to figure out where was that page on 1922 yeah. again who's this guy it's kind of non-linear storytelling yeah. i mean yeah it, it that, that's more present in the obviously because it's 300 pages long yeah I, it's sort of this i really think i would like to check out the uh the ebook yeah because i feel like this if you can choose the order and move things around yeah it would, um, it would kind of like really lend itself to. I immediately, well, I mean, this is this is jock thinking, do bro thinking. But I was immediately <laughs> like, I wanted to scan this comic and cut put out everyone order. and yeah. put it in order and see what it looked like. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can't. Which is the opposite of the point of it. You're, well, you know, but I was kind of like, curious, like I mean, what is this? No, I think no. Yes, yes. I suppose it's kind of like the opposite of the point of it because it's less clever. I mean, yeah. partly, partly I think Maguire's very aware of his own cleverness, <laughs> but, yeah. um, and he's saying, look at, look at this, you can still get, mm -hmm. look at how, look at how, you know, look at how clever this is. Yeah. And the thing is, the ebook, you can apparently yeah. do that. You can, right. you right. can click and drag and you can order the narrative. So you can do what you just right. suggested you do. Right. And I think that's, that's cool. Yeah. It's almost like a, a like a game. Yeah. You have to reconstruct the story. Yes. Which uh, we try to do in our lives. Yes. We try to put things in order mm. um, and try to remember what order things came in and mm. things like that. Mm. But, um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I must say I, I do like the six page better, partly because it doesn't have these, it doesn't have a narrative to reconstruct. Yes. It's so fragmented yeah. that it really the only things you come away thinking about is, you know, look at, look at these different perspectives yeah. on these different times. Yeah. What's the, the, the constant? The constant is, I suppose, it's not always human beings because we get dinosaurs and cows and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. 
but for me it's it's the reassuring notion that people are much the same no matter what time yes. you put them in yes okay. absolutely and one of the other things i wanted to mention about that which, which is a good point is that he doesn't have to show you couples flirting in the present like we do get that couple in the future or actually even the the archaeologists these archaeologists come in and say hey they, they hey there's kind of a site here we think there might be some indian artifacts yeah. and then when the two interns are left alone in the living room, in the room, they're like, they get kind of flirty yeah. Um, yeah. for a minute there. I guess that's a kind of parallel, but again, it's like maybe 50, 75 pages apart. Um, he doesn't punch your punch in the face with it, if no. you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, okay, so maybe that's a good point to start talking start about talking this movie about if film. we want to get into it yeah i guess so okay so this is a, a miramax release it was the second in a row i think because we did uh, my name is modesty oh yeah we did that was miramax too <laughs> yeah so uh around 2022 this movie was announced right and uh many of us who knew here fell out of our collective chairs yeah. and the comment i put on facebook was this would be like if tom hanks wanted to make a movie about Bjork's swan dress <laughs> like <laughs> what are we doing here this is not movie material um it's specifically about comics it's you know what i mean it's it's using the medium of comics why do you think you can make this movie and at the time it was announced as zemeckis tom hanks um and i don't know if Robin Wright was initially announced, but my gut feeling at the time was, okay, it's in development. It's not going to get made. They're going to look at the thing and realize we can't make a movie out of this. Well, two years later, I bought this issue of Comic Art Magazine very recently, and yeah. I was reminded of here, I was like, oh, look, what happened to that here movie yeah. they were going to make? And I Googled here news, yeah. and sure enough, coming out in October 2024, and here we are. I cannot believe it. Uh, so I, I didn't, like you, I didn't watch any trailers coming into this film. Yeah. And I was like, how are they going to do this? How do you do this? Well, is I will this say... This is going to be like a kid's... There is... You know, this is going to be like what a, a, an art student's... Like a film student's experimental film. Yeah. Are people just going to wander in and out of the frame? Yeah. Saying and doing shit? Yes. And an hour later, the film's going to end? Yes. Yeah, what a prediction that was. <laughs> Because uh, here we are, um, I have to say the first, like, ten seconds of it, I was like, oh, this is this could be interesting. Because we get a frame of the room, and then we get insets. Yep. We did get the insets, insets. just like the... It, like, it reads like the book version, because we get a two-page spread, which yep. is about the, a widescreen size. And then we get these insets. I'm like, okay, and the insets are... It eases, the movie eases you into it. We don't get title cards telling us what year it is on no, any of them. No. But the movie t lets us know, okay, this is the past. This is like near future. This is... Or not near future. Nothing's in near future. It's near past. Yeah, which um, is really important, actually. Yeah. Um, Nothing... We don't... Yes. We don't see and then, the future. Uh, but what starts to happen, or what I noticed happening was, what happens is the border of an inset will be drawn on will appear on the screen overlaid on what's existing and then you will get a fade in yeah. of it doesn't it doesn't smack into yeah. the new yeah. frame well spotted so what what often happens is that the what the inset panels will just be used to transition from one scene to another Yes. Oh, yeah. By about five minutes in the movie, their only function is in, is to transition. Yes. And they it's not like a it's not like a transition we've never seen before. We've seen these kinds of. Yeah. This isn't new. It's been done. It's been done. Even now, the example that immediately came to mind was like Bram Stoker's Dracula by Cobble. There's stuff yep. in here where there, we get cross. It's basically cross dissolving. Yep. Or cross fading, but you've got a line around what's being faded in or out. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. It very quickly after the promising beginning. Yeah. Well, <laughs> where it seems to be similar to what's going on with the with the book. So the promising beginning, you you're seeing the street, and then you you dissolve to uh, ancient times and dinosaurs, yeah. and this must be a shock for people who come into the, regular the movie, movie goer. like what's who, going on who doesn't know about Why the dinosaurs or, they're like yeah. okay this is weird but it's telling them about what kind of movies it is. but immediately i noticed the dinosaur scene goes on for quite a long time and it's not cut and we don't get inset panels of t people watching tv or whatever while the dinosaurs we just get full frame yeah. scene a scene of these dinosaurs running across yes. the landscape we get this 
blaring dramatic Alan Silvestri music <sighs> immediately. It's the like dramatic dun 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 the dinosaur score music. Is, I, I have big problems with the score of this yeah. film. Oh yeah. Well this is where it it comes in at first and this is where you start to realize uh, somehow I hadn't thought about it reading the short version of the comic and the long version of the comic. There's no sound in comics. <laughs> and that is crucial. It is yeah. really I really, you really, really notice the sound in this movie because you don't get in the when you read the comic, two people can talk over each other. In fact, twelve people can talk over each other in the book version because you got lots of panels of different years all happening at the same time in the same not in the same time, the yep. same location, and all you those and your eye is going back and forth, yep. looking at all of them at the same time. So all those people are speaking, and we can't do that. There's only one or two moments in the movie where the sound from a previous time is yep. playing over the present. Usually time. not. Whereas in the comic, that's constantly happening. Yes. People are constantly talking in the different time periods. Yeah. And you read them yeah. at, in your in the order you choose. Yes. You know, usually in a comic, there's usually a pretty clear order. Yeah. You know, Scott McCloud uses a rope to yes. show kind of like the progression of yeah. uh, like speech balloons. Yeah. There's usually a, a fairly clear order the way kind of like time is parceled out in a comic book panel. Yeah. And you read from speech balloon to speech balloon and you look at the kind of like pictures that are associated with speech balloons, you're seeing the passage of time. In... Maguire's here that you're denied that so you just read it in the order you want yes obviously that can't happen in a film because if people no. are talking over one another, here's the th I, I don't know what look I, I look back at myself before today and I think what was I expecting yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes a film has to be linear yes yes exactly you <laughs> cannot flip back to a previous page Right? Yeah. And the other thing is, the comic page, especially the short version, not so much the book version, is already divided into squares. Yeah. It's divided into frames. It's not From unusual. The they don't fade in and out the way they do We're it. We're already looking at this thing that's chopped up, and our eye can travel back and yeah. forth over the page. Yeah. Here, when you chop up a screen, which is what Ang Lee tried to do in the Hulk, yes. and is also the Hulk, curious there too, and you're like, oh, he's trying to make it look like a comic book. Yes. Here you're like, here, why is this happening in this Robert Zemeckis picture? Because it's all he's doing is fading in and out, and that he fades in, and then you get a scene of some yeah. actors that are on a stage. Yes. It's like you're watching a stage play. It is like a stage play, actually. That's what this reminds me of. Here's, of course, because we have a static point of view. We have view, a static point of view. So it reminds you of a stage Here's play. Here's my question. What? Why does it have to be a static point of view? Because there's no reason we can't cut away, just have a normal film, and then have the inset panels appear behind them or in front of them or whatever anyway and have what's ha what happened in that point in time. I guess because the movie is called here and it's there, he's well, decided it. to stick his camera down in one location. Well, it's because it's a gimmick. Yes, it is a gimmick. That's Absolutely. it. Look at the film that's shot from one point of view. Yeah. It's been done. You know, yeah. any, any film of a play. Yeah. Well, <laughs> actually, I, was, I mean, that's the other thing I was thinking. The play is, is like... The oldest art form? Yes. Almost? Yes, but I was thinking during this, watching this, that usually when you adapt a play, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, for example, people will at least walk into other rooms to, get, to pour themselves a drink. <laughs> yeah, and so. the camera will follow unless them into the, that unless room. Unless the filmmaker's doing a thing like Dogville by Lars von Trier or something. Right. Where they're like doing a thing. That's yes. what Zemeckis really is doing here. Yes. He's doing a thing. The things that make yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the things that makes the comic interesting and special, I suppose, it just can't be in a film. Well, it can because there's there's a student film of here right. that does a pretty good job. Okay, tell me about that because I haven't seen it. Well, it how long is it? Six minutes. Okay, and it pretty much does what the it's pretty much straight faithful adaptation of the six page comic. Okay, but instead of panels, it uses it does kind of wipes. Okay, so there'll be a wipe. Yeah. So it's still, you wouldn't call them scenes. Right. Instead, you just see, like the comic panel, yeah. you see the action going on contemporaneously. Okay. In different times at the same time. Okay. It's a little bit like the experience of reading. And then there'll be a wipe to show that we're going to the next panel. Ah, uh, okay. So it's quite good. Yeah. Especially considering, like, I think it was made in the 90s, so they right. didn't do it on a computer or anything. Okay. But it's still, it's like a film student thing. Yeah. Let's make, let's make a film of here. Yeah. As you pointed out, Zemeckis' film has scenes. Yes. Yes. You fade into a scene using the inset panels, which happen in a different time, and then you fade into 20 years later or 50 yeah. years later, and then we get a scene, which is, you know, a few minutes long, which you never get in either version of here. You get no. you get slices, yeah. as Chris Ware called them. Very slices. narrow slices, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and then you get a scene and we learn a little bit about these characters and then we cross fade into the next time zone. Sometimes it'll go back and forward. So it does go back and forward. It makes an effort, I suppose. But really, what's the point of scenes? The point of scenes is to tell a story. So here, we're different already from here. <laughs> in Zemeckis' film, we already have a different, a big difference from here, the comic, in both its iterations, in that we have stories. Yes. Three or four, three or four, four or five kind of narratives. Yeah. Which run in a linear fashion. Yes. We see them begin at the beginning, we see them end at the end. Is there nothing out of order? I feel like no. there might have been a couple. No, there was nothing no, out of order. always in order. Huh. We okay. always see them buying the house <laughs> and then selling the well, house. Well, okay, so this was actually... At the end. And it happens in yes, order. Yes, that, that bit at the beginning at the end was, okay, I'm going to give it two out of five for those bits. Because we see three different couples come in and buy the house and, th and two or three couples selling the house. That kind of made sense to me. Um, as, okay, here's how we're showing these parallels. Later, it's really ridiculously telegraphed some of that stuff but we'll we'll talk about that when we get to it some of the other uh, fading effects i want to talk about is sometimes he doesn't use the insets to fade he just he just has some kind of cgi effect to switch to the next time frame yeah, sometimes it'll just do a traditional fade sometimes he won't even do the panel yeah, sometimes he'll gimmick. just he'll fade to the timeline the room will be empty and then the character will fade into yeah that's screen not, that's interview nothing with like, the CGI. That's nothing like no. here. No. Well, that, it's, an, a it's, a, it's a screen adaptation. Yeah. Well, that actually fading a character into into a scene is not traditional. It's a new, relatively new CGI effect. If you know what I mean. No, no. It's just it's just as old as cinema. I, well, you just shoot I the think, empty film and then you run the reel into the. Yeah, it's a bit like the teleporter effect in Star Trek. Yeah, you know yeah, what like I mean? That. Something like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. where they kind of appear, but they'll be like you know having co phone conversation or something like that. Um, so, okay, so, we, oh, another effect that he has here that isn't in the comic is sometimes, maybe two, only two or three times, um, the inset will appear behind the character. So it's like the yeah. character's head will be in front of the inset, which is behind them, until it fades in yeah. and then completely and blocks their or, head. Yeah, or it'll be like a pointless... Right, we'll have a box around a character that's already in scene. Yeah. Like there was one with um, Paul Bettany's character, I think, where he's sort of pouring himself a drink. He's always pouring himself a drink on screen left. Yeah. And at, at one point, I think a, a panel appears around him and he's pouring his drink, but the background is already the contemporaneous that's time right. in which he's supposed to that's appear. Right. That's right. And it's like, why is that? Why even do that? Uh, yeah, I don't because know. Because we're supposed to be paying attention to him. I think it's, it was, yeah. Because you can't zoom. No, because, because <laughs> what? Instead you just draw a, bo a box around him? I'll tell you what it is. is in the comic, um, Maguire will just over completely block a, par a character's face with a new panel, yeah. inset panel, from 30 years in the past or 50 years in the future. Yeah. You will see uh, their head. And suddenly on, their head will be Someone else's off. head on top of someone I else's body. I can see yeah. why there are certain moments where... Zemeckis was like, it's going to look weird if we just suddenly chop off this person's head. Yep. We'll have his face in front of the panel, which is 30 years in the past. But then that panel will come into full frame and those characters will be chopped off anyway at the neck. And it will, it looked weird. It's anyway. funny how few risks, I mean, I suppose Zemeckis wanted people to come see his film. But it's funny for, a, <laughs> it's funny how few risks it takes considering it's, well, it, it's Robert Zemeckis doing a thing. I'm yeah. shooting my film from one angle and we'll half the time do traditional scene transitions where you just have a hard cut. Yeah. Another part of the time we'll do fade ins and outs. Yeah. And then maybe a third of the time we'll draw these boxes. Yes. Like the comic. He's trying to make it visually interesting or visually various. Uh, but the fact is it's still cramped. It still felt really cramped in this weird space. Uh, where the camera's just set down at one point and you're always looking into the corner of this room. Yep. And well, sometimes... We it never, the camera never does change. We never see different angles. No, until the and in end. fact, it's uh, another weird effect is you never get close-ups of people who are sitting on the sofa in mid yeah. they field. Can't be, they can't be close-ups because like, it's just I need the to use pe person's face. I can't quite tell which character this is yeah. or yeah. Um, what's happened, their yeah. actual yeah. emotion in this moment. Yeah. Um, so in order to get emotion, they have to come to the front of yep. the frame. So there's always these contrived reasons for the characters in to the, be walking. In the book version, camera. sometimes you'll see a giant like hand or face, and that's because they're standing 
close to the reader, right? And it takes you a minute to figure it out. It's an interesting, weird effect in the comic. Um, in the movie, you got uh, he's got to go jump through some sort of hoops. There's a funny, very subtle thing in the comic where in 1983, the long version, somebody hangs a mirror over the fireplace. And sometimes you can make out furniture on the other side of the room uh, through the mirror. And that's the only time you get to yeah. see the the fourth wall, so to yeah. speak. They do do that in the film a bit. In too, the film, they pull out a dresser. huge dresser and they go through all this artifice where the guy's so tired from moving it, they have to stop yes, moving stop. it in the middle of the living room. Oh, you made a sandwich? Thanks. I'll sit down. And that way you can see the faces of characters that are having conversation in another room, which they wouldn't be having in yeah. that living room, right? Yeah. And then we see, but then we see people in the past where that mirror isn't. That mirror shows the past. Yes. It's a weird, doesn't make sense, really. Yes. Well, Yet we see Tom Hanks's. You're and right. Robin you're White. absolutely right. Why? There is no mirror in 1967 <laughs> or whatever. Why really can we see me, them yeah. in the kitchen? As I if the mirror was there at that time. It's not there. That doesn't make any sense. You're absolutely right. Maybe the portal. No, I don't know. You know what the real bummer about this <laughs> is? I'm thinking about the mirror shot from Contact. Zemeckis' Contact. Do you remember that? Yeah. There's a scene a where where young Jodie Foster, can't remember the character's name, her dad has a is having a heart attack or something downstairs, and she runs up to the medicine cam cabinet, and then she opens it, but like it's as if the camera was inside the medicine cabinet the whole time. And it's the kind of thing you don't notice if you're just a regular viewer, but if you're like a cinema fire, you're like, holy shit, how did they do that? Mm. Was the cameraman hiding behind the mirror and pulled it into place? And the, you know, you're like, what's going on here? Yeah. And oh, here, I, I just realized this is the dumbest, there's the dumbest <laughs> artifice for the mirror being in the room in the first place. And now he's How's cheated on it. Yeah. He's yeah. absolutely cheated on it. Well. I want to talk about the thing which irritates me. I think the film's biggest sin. Yeah. All right. So as we've said, a film has to have store a narrative, right? We have scenes. The scenes have to tell a story. Yeah. So essentially we have, you know, like five, four or five stories. Yeah. And basically it's generally the story of a couple moving into the house. Yeah. Experiencing some ups and downs yeah. and then leaving the house. Yeah. But make yeah. no mistake, in this film there is actually really only one story. Yes. And the other stories are just distractions. They are absolute distractions. Some of them, it's, I couldn't tell what parallels he was trying to draw. There are no parallels. And it, it's just, it's stuff from the comic that they've just sort of pulled out and And some that in. they haven't. Okay, so, okay, there's two of them we should talk about. Yep. One of them is this guy that invents the Lazy Boy recliner. Yeah. I don't know why they were specific, but maybe they got... Right. Isn't and the maybe Lazy they got, Boy recliner made by a real person? Yes, so, and I'm sure there was maybe product placement from this company that right. were like, oh, right. please feature our product in your movie. Yeah, maybe. And they made up this character that invents a Lazy Boy in 1942. Yep. This is a very long storyline. I actually liked these people. I liked him and his the, wife the and their... The inventor and his... They're a happy his couple, happy, actually. They're the only happy couple, aren't the only they, happy, really? No, nah, I don't think... I think the couple... The, the, the African-American couple are a happy couple. Sure. In a sense, we'll, we'll talk about that. I suppose that. the um, Native American couple are happy, too. Yes. In fact, they only get four scenes but actually the scene where the native american gives a necklace to his girlfriend i actually love that moment it's the only looking at that side of the screen but then when i saw the cgi squirrel on the other side and looking at this frame that looks <sighs> like a shame. stage it looks like they built yeah. a forest on a stage good. it looks like a high school production i was like good. what is this so, You've, because there's no a, house there in Native American times, because I get Native American, we, we, we're not going to show one of their, you know, one of their temporary or semi-permanent dwellings. Instead, they're wandering around like magic, you know, like yeah. magic tribesmen. Yes. This is, I really didn't like this Native American stuff, because it felt very different from the way it was presented in yeah. the Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Where they no. felt like real people. Yes. Okay. Here, they you, were mystical You natives. have hit the nail on the head. Them. Even the mysticism. Later, we get a scene of the wife having died and the old man. Uh, yep. the, the partner who's now With an old crappy man. old man CGI. And he yeah. he touches her necklace as she's being taken away to be buried. Uh, I don't know what the funeral rites are, but anyway, she's being taken away. Her corpse is being taken away. And he touches the necklace and we remember that. And then we cut to the present and the archaeologists who are in the comic have arrived at the house, but they find the necklace in the very next moment. <laughs> and the woman who's living in the house, Rose, who now, um, she's had a stroke and She's not entirely there. She's like, oh, here's this necklace. So the point was to just show this necklace, this romance which had happened in the past and which was pretty poignant in the comic. Here is just a plot device 
in a comic which has no plot, it's there to show you. Yeah. I don't know what the point of it is. Here's here's a connection between the past and present. I guess. Did we need this? No. No. It doesn't, there's no point to it. It doesn't tell us anything. No. And, and there's another parallel where after someone has died, we get to see that old man grieving, mourning. The Indian man yep. on a rock in the forest by himself just for a moment. <laughs> Sitting there in his buckskin looking very, yes. or whatever. Um, but very... <laughs> you mentioned but... CG. We do have to talk about this is the, this is real. They CG younged, what do they call the word? De-aged. De-aged. They de-aged um, Tom Hanks and Tom Robin Hanks Wright. And Robin Wright. Uh, it looks better than even five years ago when we de-aged uh, Samuel L. Jackson for uh, Captain, Captain Marvel. Marvel. The tech is getting better and also depends on your crafts people who are doing it. And Zemeckis has all he's been at the forefront of this. Contact Force Gump. He was the first guy to like place Force Gump with JFK and all that kind yep. of stuff. Yep. He's the guy for this. I thought it looked not bad. I mean, it, it, this is we I hate even saying it because I, I, I despise this use of I, I think that this is oh, a, I, the yeah, death of, course. of art. Of course. But you're right, it doesn't look that bad. I mean Tom Hanks' first appearance where he's a kid. Yeah. And They've, they've kind of fucked with his voice a bit to make it sound right, younger. Right. But Tom Hanks' grown-ass man voice comes out of a like a 13-year-old yeah, kid. Yes. And I was just like, oh! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. But hold on, hold on. I, I, I have to rewind a bit. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. I hate AI. We both hate AI. I want to we, we are all to... over the place because I wrote my notes in the dark <laughs> with an LED pen in a cinema, which we've never done before, and we watched the movie two hours ago. So yeah. <laughs> it's all here. I haven't. I did just a re yeah. the, this episode is all over the place, as the comic is. Yeah. Yes. Maybe it's appropriate. Good. Okay. It is appropriate. Yes. But I wanted to. I wanted to talk about what I thought was the movie's biggest sin. Okay. Which and I mentioned that we have some narratives. Yes. Which happen in a linear fashion. Like, we, we don't get non really genuine non-linear storytelling. We basically see... We just have four or five different narratives that make themselves felt over the length of the film, but they happen in chronological order. Yeah. We, we almost always see them at the start of their lives, yeah. the middle of their lives, the end of their lives. Yeah. Now, I say four or five narratives, but actually there's only really one. And as, yes. as I mentioned, it's the story of Tom Hanks and Robin Wright's characters, Ricky and Margaret. Yes. And the story of their life in the house from when they were, well, in Ricky's case, from when he was a baby. Yes. Uh, or, or, or a very young child. And, uh, and in Robin Wright's case, she arrives sort of a, in, in a teenage time. I'm going to interject. I'm going to Please do. One tab for one second. Yes. I think Ricky... A.K. Richard was supposed to be Richard McGuire because oh, the first time we see him drawing, he's drawing the living room, oh. and his dad says, "What are you drawing the living room for? What's the point of that?" They're gonna make a buck out of that. Yeah, this and his name is Richard. His name amazing. is Richard. He draws the living room. I think that was a nod to Richard McGuire. The only nod because we didn't notice any mention of him in the. Again, we weren't paying I, attention. I was trying to pay attention, and I didn't see. I like noted, noting how it's credited based on the we novel, mentioned. graphic novel, comic. Or based on the work, whatever, by Richard McGuire. I didn't notice the credit. Uh, so, sorry for that. No, no, no. fans, if that's yeah. the kind of detail you look for in these episodes. Yeah. Um, no, we didn't... I, I don't think it was there, actually. It, I, I think we might have missed it, but I think maybe it wasn't there. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so... Interesting. I didn't notice that. Yeah. But, okay, so the main story... And, I mean, you see the promotional posters for this film. It's yeah. got Tom Hanks, a DH, Tom Hanks, a DH, Robin Wright. Yes. This is what here is about. Yes. It's about their story. And here's the thing. Their story, A, is not very interesting. Yes. <laughs> yes. And B, it's also very localised in time. It's kind of the story of Tom Hanks and his boomer problems. Yes. Well, we get you know, his father's like the problems Vietnam. First. Yep. Yeah, but again, this is that's it's only a small part. Yes. We get a little bit, but the main story. First of all, it's different in the comic because we have a main story. Yes. And second of all, the main story is really, I mean, it's the story of growing up in the fifties, yeah. working through the seventy, the seventies and eighties, yeah. and retiring in the twenty first century and traveling around the world. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> Essentially, the life of the average person born in the immediate post-war yes. period. But it's just, a, it's just a marriage much reviled generation that of falls boomers. apart, uh, and not and, and the time jumps make it because we've interspersed it with these stories of like the guy that invents a lazy boy, which goes nowhere and does nothing. Yeah. has very few parallels, if any, except to contrast well, the happy really. marriage. Yeah. 
Um, there aren't many parallels in any of the. I don't get. I don't stories, get what it's because that's not what this is about. Yeah. This there's, is just those other stories are just window dressing yeah. for the story of the love and experience. Yeah. Of Tom Hanks and Robin Wright. Which, when you cut it out, might be 15, 20 minutes of story time. It's really short. It's like, imagine watching a sitcom and cutting the A story and B story apart and looking at how many scenes are there for each story. Oh, I, I it's think three, it's, it's most of the film. Yeah. Well, yes, but I will point out, there was one moment that I liked, okay, so about that storyline, the main storyline. At the beginning of the movie, we see old man Tom Hanks come into a house, an empty, the empty room. Yeah. And say th he says to the real estate agent, thank you for letting me do this. And he yeah. sets up two pages. Then the rest of the movie, it's two almost... Chairs. He two, sets two, two chairs. He sets up two chairs. And then it's like, um, it's a, the rest of the movie is a bit like uh, get, Saving Private get, Ryan. How we get to this how point. How we get to the point. Very common cinematic device. Yeah. Show the end so first. Yep. The moment I liked was she, throughout these scenes, she wants to move out of the house. She wants her own house. She doesn't like living with their parents, which is an artifice of the movie to get them yeah. to stay in that same room. Because it's... You know, yeah, and yeah. she wants to move out. She's like, let's move out. He comes. He every ten years we see him. He's like, no, the economy's bad, or I'm not making enough money, etc., etc. Yeah. He had ambitions being an artist, but one year for Christmas, for Christmas present, he gives her designs for a house, yep. which he's designed, and it's awesome. But I like that moment because we know that house is never going to be built because we've seen the present at oh, the yeah. opening scene of the movie, and I was like, that is. I missed that. That's one of the few moments it wasn't telegraphed. Around. Right. Oh, there's so many tele other, many other things are telegraphed. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I just feel watching this story from to come from the comic. I'm jumping ahead to adaptation, but to come from a comic which seems to say so many fun things about you, the universal human experience, to a, the the very kind of narrow experience of a person born in the 1950s. Yeah. The way, you know, like Robin Wright and Tom Hanks, the way they kind of like felt compelled by circumstances to abandon their dreams and get into, go to work in a suit and tie in the office and stay home and raise the kids. It's like, you're looking at a very narrow slice of human history here. Yeah. This isn't, this isn't the story of the infinite potential of human beings passing through this space. Yes. This is a very specific story about... Someone of Tom Hanks's age experiencing the kind of things Tom Hanks might have experienced if he hadn't been so good at acting. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that to me is very, like, very, very disappointing. Yes. It's really just a, a, a fairly kind of boring story. Absolutely, hundred percent. About you know, like some frustrated boomers uh, with a lot of gimmicky window dressing. Yes. Okay. There's two tabs I want to open based on what you've said. Please. First is we've had a disagreement in the car about Paul Bettany. <laughs> well, or did we? Let's get, we on. did. I thought he was terrible in this movie. <laughs> I thought he was doing really a one-man show of Death of a Salesman, salesman <laughs> the whole time. He comes and he was so overacting, over the right. top. And he's, he's yelling all his he's lines. He's yelling all the time. And he's delivering like he's on stage of playing course, to an audience. Like. Um, I see that now. And it drove me crazy and I thought... This is a good actor, a serious actor, and I was like, this this is the one, the ball that you dropped. Like, you screwed uh, up. Didn't have enough time to rehearse. I don't know what was going like on. Zemeckis told him, this is going to be like a play. We're going to have a fixed POV. Yeah. You're just going to be stalking around yep. a five meter by five meter stage. Yeah. It'll be like a play. Yeah. And, you know, like, Bettany's like, run with it. Right. I, I don't know why I enjoyed right. it so much because he's so strident. He's screaming his lines a lot of the time. Yeah. Like his character is supposed to be hard of hearing. Yeah. Some of the time, but not all of the okay, time. Okay, so that's actually there. That's in the comic. It's in the book version. <laughs> There's an old man who has to sleep on. He's had an accident in the nursing home. Has yeah. to be brought home and sleep is sleeping on a pullout couch. Yeah. Um, and there's a scene where he's having trouble hearing his son, uh, but then he actually realizes he's actually just joking. He was yeah. just kidding that he couldn't hear what he said. Now, in the movie, this is these lines, there's a lot of dialogue from the comic yes. in the movie. What's happened is they've, but they've, they've done what you said. They've printed them out, and they've penned them up on the wall, yes. and said, ah, here's how we can make right. the narrative. That's right, because this turns into a an issue for the Robin Wright character where yeah. she's like, I don't want your dad living here. Yeah. And she, that's almost the straw that breaks the camel's back and she ends up moving out and leaving Tom Hanks. Yeah. Because she feels trapped. She's a yeah. very yeah. 20th century woman. Yeah. But we get the same joke about how he, he, oh, I can't hear you, Sonny. And he's like, I was just joking. You know, that's annoying too, because at, up to that point, Paul Bettany's character, Al, 
had had no sense of humor. Yes. And, yes. and now he's making jokes? Yes. Because it's dialogue lifted straight from the comic. Bizarre. Like, Even the Lazy Boy guy, there's a line of dialogue in the comic where the guy says something about how what we smell is molecules of stuff. I think that's yep. in the comic. Yeah. And it's just a non sequitur. You're like, what is this person talking about? You'd never know. You never find out. You don't know why he's saying this. Well, he's in an this, inventor. He's type. a scientist. He's, yeah, yeah. He's an inventor. That's why. We have to have a reason. Yeah. Oh, you're for, right. Yeah. Yeah. For, you know, everything that happens. Um, now, there are some other moments of parallels. There's a leak in the roof in one sequence, uh, and that is immediately, we get an inset where uh, Robin writes water breaks. Yeah. Okay, there's a little bit of that. Um, yeah, that, that, that reminded me. I, I wrote between. that down yeah. because it reminded me of the kind of thing that would happen in the comic. There is a moment I like. Maguire li likes those juxtapositions. Yeah, but here's another moment that was like, Oh boy, what's happening in this in this movie? There's a scene once the baby is born. This is Vanessa, their baby d girl. <laughs> there's a scene where um, Tom Hanks is holding her and looking at the moon and says, "Look at that moon up there." And the moon we see is actually an inset panel, which you've had earlier in the movie of like 1901 or something like that. I think it's specifically actually the uh, Native American uh, Okay, yeah. Yes. One. Right. The, the magical Okay, so it's 16 The magical landscape, right. the magical so, mossy landscape that's is right. there wandering around. So she, he's looking at the moon. I'm like, "Okay, that's actually a moment that makes sense because it's the same moon." But it's the same moon. But how many times in your life has someone said to you, "We're looking at the same moon that people looked at a thousand years ago?" Isn't that amazing? How many <laughs> Movies, comics, books, have you read that exact yeah. line? And here they've just literalized a cliche. Now, it's a poignant point. cliche. In real life, it is a poignant thing to look at the moon and think about and that actually fact. That, and, yeah, and also, it's few, it's few, and, these moments are few and far between yes. as well. Yes. Like, the film's not taking advantage of this oh, device yeah. Yeah. pretty much at any, uh, hardly ever at any other time, you know. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about uh, Ben Franklin. Okay, so in the movie, in the comic, you see this man and a woman in the 1800s driving up to this colonial house. Uh, in a, in a and awesome they're carriage, talking yeah. about how he's annoyed that his father's going to show up with, his, with that man's son. So grandfather and son are living together. And he's annoyed by this fact. And um, he's annoyed that he's against the crown or something like that. Yep. And we're not sure who these characters are. Yeah. It takes a very long time, and then at some stage there's a Halloween party and somebody's dressed as Ben Franklin. Then later on we learn that they are talking about Benjamin Franklin. Yep. Okay? We don't... It takes a long time to piece yep. together the what's going on. And also is... piece together the irony of somebody dressed up as Ben Franklin at a Halloween party on the same location where Brent, Ben Franklin lived. Well, you know, no, he didn't or, live or there. he didn't his, live there. He visited. His son. His illegitimate yeah, son. He had been there. on that... Actually on that pathway yep. leading up to the house, the horse trail, right? The carriage trail. Yep. Okay, in this movie... The first time we get this couple, William and his wife, going up to the house, uh, he says, my stupid father doing experiments with electricity, flying kites yeah, in the rain. Okay. And you're like, oh, okay, it's Ben Franklin. Then we get a Halloween party. Very, It's a comic. It's one inset on one page. Very extended scene with people doing this routine. Two people dressed as Ben Franklin doing a routine. Well, it's uh, Tom and Hanks then, and uh, his younger brother, the character of his right. younger brother, the one that joins the Navy and yes. goes to fight in Vietnam. And then they <laughs> dissolve to the scene of Ben Franklin. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, come on. Do we really need to bang it over our head like this? Like, it's so in your face. Uh, very annoying how telegraphed this Ben Franklin stuff was. I had to write down Ben Franklin in my notes twice. Yeah. Because of it. Yeah. Yeah. There are other instances of this kind of thing going on too. Uh, Robin Wright, it, quite early on in the film, starts becoming forgetful. Yes. Like, and they really lay it on really thick. Yes, she forgets where they live, which is a point that it's like, okay, well, she hates living in this house. So we know she knows where she lives. So that's kind of a detail that was like, even if she's developed, it was early onset on Alzheimer's, is that a bit far-fetched. I don't know, maybe it's maybe that is how Alzheimer's works. No, it's not. But she hasn't lived in any other house for 30 years. Yeah. Well, it, it, it is actually how it works, but it's too soon. It, it's just a it's just a Chekhov's gun and a really kind of like obvious one. Yes, and here's my problem. No one problem. is going to fail to notice, know that Robin is going to develop dementia if this film, which is so, you know, where we only see scenes from, <laughs> from one perspective. Yeah. When people wander in and say stuff, it's usually significant to the 
yeah. plot. Yeah. If, if Robert Wright's wandering in and saying, I forgot where we live. Yeah. And I'm like, I was like, you're going to get dementia. Yes. Now, here's my problem with this. With, we only had two other mentions of this. One near it's the end where she forgot enough. something else. If and then find the final scene where she's got full... She forgot her jacket and, um, you know, like uh, Tom Hanks says, oh, she forgets things a lot these days. Yes. And she's she got forgot, a lot she forgot something mind. else in the holidays. There was maybe a third moment where she forgot something. Okay. Anyway, but, but my it's point... it's just a very, look, very... Here's what I'm trying to get it's to. It's very clear that that was what was going to happen. Yes, but this is all just a plot point to set up the final scene of the movie. Yeah. What if you could use the narrative format of these amazing comics that Richard McGuire made to somehow find a metaphor about Alzheimer's? There is an artist out there... Story. There is an artist out there that could figure this out, that could unlock this and figure out how does Alzheimer's work? Is there some way I can present this with these inset panels that would represent how it feels to have Alzheimer's? This movie is not that no, piece of art. This is just... <laughs> this is just... And it was so... That was, to me was... Now, we can't complain about what a movie isn't, but that was such a letdown there. There's crazy stuff. I mean, there's a moment here where there's a... Um, they actually try to make a... They actually pull a connection between the Spanish flu and COVID, which was... I liked that. I liked it. It's an example of something Maguire would have done. Exactly. So, yeah. uh, one of the earlier iterations of the couple, I suppose, uh, a guy that likes to fly planes, and it seems like it's been leading up to him dying in a plane crash. The whole... Speaking of, you know, like, telegraphing things. Because yeah. his wife is constantly saying, stop going up in the plane. Yeah. You're going to die in a fucking plane yeah. crash. Yeah. When you took our daughter up in the plane, how could you? Yeah. And then he's dead. Yeah. And they have an open casket. Yeah. And we see the the backs of the heads of two blokes at this wake that's occurring or the, yeah. or this this viewing of the of the body that's occurring yeah. in the house. And we see the backs of their heads and they say, Bold choice to have an open casket. I didn't think much was left after a plane accident. And he goes, like, didn't you hear? He didn't die in a plane accident. He died of the flu. And they turn and look at one another and they're wearing cloth masks. Yeah. And it's like ah. Yeah. Right. Sure. So this is the Spanish flu of the nineteen yeah. early nineteen late uh, teens, early nineteen twenties. So, and then of course we get a scene set in the twenty twenty where a black couple is who have since moved into the house after Tom Hanks sold it. Yeah. Have um are selling the house during COVID and they bump elbows the way people did. Yes. <laughs> and their maid their maid dies of COVID. Oh, yes, yeah, she There's does. There's a scene yeah. where she can't smell the flowers, and she's like, that's strange, I cannot smell. Yeah. And then the Thank next you. scene we yep. see them, She's she get, the wife gets a phone call that yep. that woman has died. Yeah, and she died 20 minutes ago, which is... And we, we get a similar scene earlier on where a mate of them, after hearing a joke... Yes. ...laughs himself to death. Yes, and that's in the comic at the very beginning, yep. in the in the book version. So, um, the, the I kind of liked the... Uh, Spanish flu COVID comparison. Yes. It reminded me of the sort of thing Maguire would do. Yes. Now, I did want to po point out one thing. We haven't talked about the black couple very much. They're in three or four scenes. Like, all the other couples, like, doesn't why are they in this movie? Yeah. Maybe to Just have the COVID dressing. metaphor. That's the only reason they're in <laughs> yeah. there. Fine. The, the best scene in this movie is a very chilling scene where the father and mother sit the son down, who we know has just turned 16 from a previous scene, so he's going to get his driver's license, and the dad sits him down to tell him what to do when he's pulled over by the cops. Yeah. Where to put your hands, how to open the glove box, how to moderate your voice, all that kind of stuff. It is a sh shocking, amazing moment. It's the one moment where I felt like the camera was at the right distance from the actors. It felt where too could, painful yeah. to look at up close. It's a, it's a scene that we as not black people don't have access to or we don't, we never had that conversation. What the fuck is it doing in this movie? <laughs> That's how I feel too. It has no, if the film has was... no parallel to any other scene in this movie. It belongs in a completely different, it's a There's great scene that, that does not belong in this movie. The rest of it was pure schmaltz. It, no. Yes, exactly. It's total, it's sentimental schmaltz with no significance, no depth. Suddenly we get the scene out of nowhere. Is it just trying to tell us this is what it's like in 2020 for a 16 year old? We don't get a parallel for 16 year olds in other areas. Except for Vanessa, who for some reason has her earphones on, the daughter of Tom she's always and wearing a walk. Robin, and she's dancing when they're getting family 
photo. She's still got her walk around. She's dancing around until he physically pulls the earphones. I'm like, is how is she that oblivious? It's so that bizarre. That's, no one acted like that. Is that supposed to be some sort of modern commentary on people on their phones or something? Because no one acted like but that. But we don't get people on their phones in 2020. We no. never see that. You know what? It, it, uh, the only thing it reminded me of was in Terminator, there's a scene where Sarah Connor's girlfriend, her roommate, is wearing her headphones while she's having sex with a guy. And that movie had a purpose because in that movie, people are addicted to technology. And anytime you see any sort of tech, it's prevent presented in a negative way. I don't know why she was wearing the headphones and dancing around like crazy while she's getting the fan. And she it's not like she's blind. She can see what's going on. Yeah. Bizarre. Totally weird choice. Yeah. Um, just one of many things that happened in this movie. All right, I want to talk about the end. Oh, wait, hang on. There's one scene I want to talk about before we get to the ending. Good uh, So sometimes you get a bit of forced gumpiness when we know what year it is, because we don't get title cards, as we mentioned, telling us the year in each frame, Yeah. Uh, by music. So uh, there's yeah. a scene when Tom Hanks comes home at 18 years old, the age Tom Hanks comes home to tell his parents that his girlfriend, what was her name? The Robert Margaret. Lee? Margaret is pregnant. We know the year because uh, the Beatles are on TV on... On the the show. You know the one. Yes. The Car Carson someone? No, it's not Johnny Carson. It was... Uh, are you sure it's not Johnny Carson? No, 100%. It was uh, the Ed Sullivan Show. Oh, of course it's the Ed Sullivan Show. Ed Sullivan Show. Of course it was. So, um, uh, so that's on TV. Now, then we have a dissolve in the background shows their wedding, which takes place in the living room, but the inset panel has remained the Beatles. Yeah. So the, I thought that's that's one of the times where the music continued because we kill, still hear the Beatles song while the wedding's happening. So it's that's diegetic music which I liked. I wish there was more. I of like that. Them. Here's Unless. what I didn't like. The next scene it dissolves to the uh, Native American girl wandering through the forest collecting berries or something like that. The thing I didn't like was Zemeckis didn't have the bravery to leave the Beatles inset on screen. Yeah. That's wow, what McGuire American. would have done to make you think about yeah. all the things that are happening in this space and all the lives that have been lived here, all yeah. the life that has been here. No, it, no this film doesn't take those kinds of risks. Because uh, someone would have been going, hey, hang on, this is my magical Native American scene. She's gathering berries in this pristine yes. kind of like landscape. Yes, and we don't have the Beatles. We don't have That's like right. kind of degradation of culture or something. You know, there's no... No, There's no, you don't take nostalgia. anything away from it. No, I get it. No. no, it's just the Beatles scene is just there to... Date it. Date, and to then... give you the date, and then to have a little bit of... There's a kind of nice parallel when we get the wedding. It shows how quickly this wedding happened as well. Yeah, you know? it's the same year, presumably. Yeah. And, um, yeah, because she's pregnant, so it's a shotgun wedding. But, yeah, I mean, and it's an example I, of the music. Like, with this gimmick, this device yeah. of having inset panels... It does it sometimes. Sometimes there's a radio in a panel yeah. playing music. You could do it in any scene you're playing music in this movie. Mm. The music could be all diegetic. Yeah. No, we're not taking that risk. Instead, we're going to layer this syrupy... Yeah. The Sylvester soundtrack, yeah. It's the score. It's really bad. It's an awful score. Yeah. It's so schmaltzy. Yeah. It's so saccharine. It's there to tell you how to feel. Yes. In every scene. So infuriating the way that they keep playing this music and telling me how to feel. You could have done something really clever. Like, your whole point in making this film is because you want to ram this gimmick down our throat. Yeah. You know, Zemeckis. At least have the balls to have the music coming out of radios in little panels all around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very yeah. frustrating, disappointing. And of course, and now I come to uh, the ending. The ending. Let's talk about the ending. Which, Lay it out. Which um, really hammers home what Zemeckis thought he was doing. Because a key point with this film is that we never see the future. Yeah. Because, of course, the the, story, the film ends when the story ends. Yes. Because it's the story of Ricky Let and Margaret. Let me interrupt Margaret. for a moment. There's a line in the movie where I think the pilot comes in and says... Um, the future there's, so yeah. there's only the future. Yeah. The past is gone. And you're... That is really this Eric like Roth and Zemeckis the... say, that's projecting what the movie's about in the first 15 minutes, right? Ah, here we're going to show you snippets of the past the whole way through. The he's past, in the past. The past is present in, on screen in this movie. Get that's it? what he's telling he's you. He's in the past. Ironically, he never has the balls to go into the future right. because the book, as I mentioned, is about your imagination of what yep. you imagine the world is going to be like. It yep. makes you think about what you think this... the world's going to be like, and you can't do that. Yeah, or, or showing that people in the future will be doing things. 
you know, much like... Yes, exactly. But, it's, but of course, because this film is the story of Tom Hanks and Robin Wright, that's where it cuts off. Yes. So we never see the future. We ne- like, how hard would it have been to show the house burning down in the future? But I guess then people would be scratching their heads going, oh, fucking... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when does Tom Hanks get caught in a fire? Yes. No, yeah, so you can't show the house on fire or anything like that. The film ends with Tom Hanks bringing Robin Wright now in Hollywood, having Hollywood Alzheimer's. Where she's forget, she's sort of completely normal, but just really, really forgetful. She's forgotten everything. She's forgotten her daughter. Yeah. She's forgotten him, I yep. think. So I'm not sure how he convinced her to come to this strange house that she doesn't remember. Yep. So she's hey, got, you don't know who I am, but come to this she's house. She's got with Hollywood me. Alzheimer's, which is amnesia, basically. Yes. She has amnesia. Uh-huh. So she, he's brought her in the house, hoping that I don't know. That he's hoping that he can shock her out of her amnesia by. Well, I think it's the just house. the last chance to see because it's on sale. Yeah, it's but the he's house brought her empty. back there to talk it's to her. It's one moment, yeah. He's caring maybe, for he's, maybe he's hoping it'll... So, and of course then she... Now, this she hated this house. Yeah. From day one. Yeah. She was never happy in yeah. it. Yeah. The whole way through the film, it's just been all about how she feels trapped by it. Yeah. You know, um, then in this final scene, Tom Hanks is like, who's been a kind of like oblivious husband <laughs> the whole way through? And he's like, look, Margaret, do you remember me? Do you remember this house? And she's like, nope. Do you remember our daughter? Nope. Oh, you remember when she lost the ribbon and it was right here and you found the Suddenly ribbon? Suddenly that triggers something. And then that triggers her and she wakes up and she goes, Oh yeah, the ribbon. I found it between two couch cushions. Right there and the couch was brown. And it's like she's coming mm-hmm. back. It's all very cliched. Like he's brought her memory back. Magically. He's cured her and I don't know if it's come back, but she's remembered this moment. And I- then she says, I love this house. Yeah. yeah. I love it here. Yeah. Last word of the movie is here, in case we didn't know. Now what it was okay so <laughs> first of all so yeah the film ends with their story ending yes right. and the word so here as if we want did we, as if we you know like this is supposed to be a, a, a story this is supposed to be a device where you can tell a story across the broad yeah stripes of history yeah no 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 you were just here for tom hanks yeah and his middle-aged thanks okay and the other thing is she hated that house yeah so i found this depressing this yes. is but this is she's not Margaret anymore. Yeah. Alzheimer's has turned her brain to porridge. Yeah. She now walked into a room that she always disliked and couldn't wait to escape and is thrilled to be there. Mm. I'll tell you an anecdote. Okay. My nan had Alzheimer's. Okay. All her life she drank black tea. Okay. <laughs> black tea. Okay. Then when she went to the nursing home yeah. with Alzheimer's, the staff didn't know that she blank, drank black tea, so they made her white tea. Okay. And she would just drink it. Yeah. And my pa, my grandpa, when he saw this, would shake his head with absolute bewilderment <laughs> and say, she didn't even like it when you stirred her tea with a milky spoon. <laughs> right. <laughs> but such is the disease that... Okay, well, this is what's happened with Robin Wright, Margaret here. And that's fucking she depressing. Used to, she used to hate the house, and now she's been seeing it with new eyes and empty and without all the baggage... She loves the it's house. It's more like she's sufficiently brain damaged okay. that she's become a totally to different out, person. I want to point out another thing here, uh, which is a, this is the first time you get camera movement. So the camera starts yes, to zoom, thing, yeah. zoom in towards their faces. Yeah. We get a close-up and then the camera swivels around and does an, um, you know, one of these amazing Zemeckis moves where it backs out of the window and up into the yep. sky, which is how... It's fun. Which is it's how, like an orbital shot. Like a... Yep. Yeah. Well... I don't know quite how they did it. It's like a crane shot up in above a computer. The front. Yeah, it was done in a computer, obviously, but uh, this is how Forrest Gump ended, right? With the leaf oh, over yeah. the trees. But we also get a shot of a hummingbird, which we had seen that in ancient times. But also, that hummingbird sounds like a helicopter. Do, do hummingbirds sound like helicopters? I know, I have two points about it. I have three points about this hummingbird. The hummingbird, um, we had seen it in like dinosaur times and in Native American times, and now we're seeing it in the present. Um, we shouldn't have seen it in dinosaur times because uh, maybe have been we didn't. Maybe I got that. Wrong. I thought no, no, you're right. We, we get a we get a transition straight from the dinosaur to the hummingbird. Okay, so and is there? It a... looks like it's in the Jurassic, and of course there were no birds. Okay, but um, I don't know why this hummingbird is flying so high up. Yeah. Above these buildings where there are no trees. Yeah. What's it doing there? Yeah, they uh, they they just sort of hover, don't they? Why would it be hovering so high? Yeah. Also, where there do, are no uh, trees in urban, wings, this urban it area. It sounds like a motorcycle. As well, it's wings. Yeah. It's like, okay. Well, so this is the, the, the first camera movement. Yeah. 
Um, why the now? only The only camera. Why, why, why is it important for us to see the outside of the house? We've seen, also, we've seen so many people, uh, well, not so many, but we've seen lots of different people on this spot. Yeah. The only time the camera moves away is the last time Tom Hanks and Robin Wright are in the house. Again, cementing yeah. the fact that this film is not the story of here. Yeah. It's the story of Tom Hanks and Robin Wright. Yeah. Yeah. And their relationship to that place. It's not at all about a, a, a timeless window on yeah. a certain location. Yeah. It's the story of Ricky and Margaret. And again, that again, this just infuriated me. Yeah. That's when you move the camera? Yeah. Thanks for really hammering home that I just watched a dumb suburban drama. Yeah. And nothing that nothing yeah. and it wasn't clever at all. Yeah. Yeah. It drives me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> um Okay, do you have any trivia about this movie that just came out three or four days ago? Not really. Okay. But uh, I do have some uh, some all-star data. Okay. Okay. Uh, we, this film is actually kind of heavy on the almost but not quite comic book movie Oblivion All-Stars. Okay, yeah, right. Uh, so, uh, as we mentioned, Paul Bettany gives a powerhouse performance thinking he's on a, <laughs> <laughs> thinking he's on a suburban stage somewhere. Yeah. Uh, he, of course, is... Uh, in a, quite a lot of comic book movies. He's yep. uh, Vision yep. in the Marvel movies. Of course, we'll never cover them. He's also Jarvis, the voice of yep. kind of like Tony Stark's robot butler. Yep. I also discovered something interesting. Uh, he's in a film that came out in 2011 called Priest. Okay. Seems like one of these Blade type movies. Blade, Matrix, Underworld, oh, Ultraviolet. Okay. About vampires huh. and darkness and nighttime based on a Korean comic book. Really? Not on our list. Okay, well, we'll put that on the list. May, although, caveat, yes. maybe a cheat, because apparently the comic book that it's based on was inspired by a video game. Oh. The Blood video game. Oh. I don't know if you've played that. It's first-person shooter. Okay. Huh. I don't know. I think it's I think it's right on the edge. Okay. We'll, we'll put it somewhere. <laughs> uh, the wife of the uh, black couple... Yeah. Helen Harris is okay. the character's name. Played by Nikki Amuka Bird is the actor. She was an old... Was she? She was the epilepsy lady, the lady that died of oh, epilepsy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> She's moving up in the world. Okay. Or is she? Because this one <laughs> sucks too. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, Tom Hanks, of course, we'll see him again. Yes. Obviously, he's a big-time movie star, but yep. also he, <laughs> he's going to come back in Road to Perdition. Yeah. And Robin Wright. Yes. Quite active in the... DCU yeah. as uh, a uh, as an Amazonian yeah. warrior, yeah. I believe. Wonder Woman's mother, maybe even. Can't remember. I have seen she's that first. An, of those. She's an important character. She's very she's very tough. Yeah, <laughs> she's like yes. a warrior character. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's pretty much everything. Okay. Oh, budget. This film costs forty-five to fifty million dollars wow. to make. Expensive CG. A lot of CG credits yeah. in there. Expensive CG and maybe paying for music rights. And Tom Hanks' salary, presumably, although yeah. he did produce it. Uh, of course, we don't know how much money it's made because it's only been out less than a week. Right. But its opening weekend only made five million dollars. Okay. Not great. Open fifth, opening like a fifth most popular. So it's movie. doing worse than Joker two. <laughs> <laughs> so we got competing comic book movies in cinemas right now, and they're both doing and pretty both terrible. <laughs> they're both doing pretty bad. Bummer. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, shall we do our votes? Yes. Okay, so the two comics. I might have to split my vote. Okay. Uh, six pager loved it. Yeah. I, I, although on rereading, it does. You start to. It didn't have the impact it did the first time. Sure. It's a really shock. It's a shock to the system the first time you read it. Yeah. And I and I was thrilled too. I used the word delight yeah. earlier. Delighted. Yeah. To read it and see what someone had done with something so familiar. Yeah. The rereads, it's kind of like, okay. I see that there's not much else you can do. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, 2014 comic I didn't really enjoy as okay. much. Yeah. It felt like just more of the same. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to split my vote. Yay for the six page and okay. nay for the 2014. I'm going to go yay for both. Good. Um, I think the the long version was only marred by the existence of the short version. I think if the short version didn't exist, you would still read the 2014 version of here and go, holy shit. This is amazing. Yeah, maybe, um, but also I, I kind of feel like when you take away the panels, yes, it, that is that's an element of it too. Yeah, it feels less like a comic. You're right, 
and more like a, like a picture book. Yes, you're right about that. Too. Or like a collection of art. Yeah. It's you don't have that. It just feels less like a comedy. Yeah. So that's another reason why I don't like it as much. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna go yay for both anyway. Good. But anyway, the first that uh, six pager is you can find it online. I'll put the link in the show notes. Uh, it'll take you five seconds to read, and then you'll read yeah. it again, and it'll take you an hour to read, and then you'll think about it for the rest of your life. Anytime That's you think cool. about comics, you'll be like, remember that thing that that guy did? Like, holy cow, that was one of the most amazing things I've ever read. Yeah, I just... Uh, it was an absolute bombshell when it hit. In, I just really in, like... In, yeah. I just, as I said, I, we've, we've, got, we've taken away different, slightly different... I mean, we both. I think we can both agree on what, what we think it means, but... Like, for you, it's about kind of like the, the permanence of place. Yes. What happened on this spot? Yeah. What will happen? What yeah. did happen? Yeah. Isn't it astonishing that so many people's feet will tread the same place? Yeah. And have so many different experiences. And for me, it was... Isn't it remarkable how similar people are? Yeah. Isn't yeah. it amazing how in a, in a person's life, there'll be joy, there'll be love, there'll be work, searching, breaking, wandering... All of these yep. things, just over and over again, yep. isn't the human experience in wonderful? Six yep. tiny, <laughs> in six tiny six six pages. pages, these tiny panels that appeared in RAW. These are small pages. It's like a paperback-sized book, and yeah. it was just like, it is, how it's, is it's this incredible. happening in my brain? It's a how towering is it my brain of art. Like uh, yeah. Uh, yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, now this... Picture which reunites the Forrest Gump team. <laughs> That's right. And Zemeckis, Tom Hanks, Robin Wright, the screenwriter. Yeah. Same Eric screenwriter. Roth. Eric Roth. Eric Roth. Yeah. And of course the composer. Yeah, Alan Silvestri. Yeah. This is. I mean, Forrest Gump was a. Yeah. It's a hell. It's some... a heck of a film. I mean, although apparently it never really, it never because of Hollywood accounting, it never made money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes, that's right. Specifically, that was the movie that, that notorious. Invented, it invented the term Hollywood accounting. Yeah, it's notorious for never having I think they didn't want money. to pay extra money to the writer of the novel yes. or something like He's that. He's never seen a cent. Yeah. What an outrage. Yeah. Anyway, so it's reuniting that dynamite team to make Oh my this... god, I just started having <laughs> conspiracy theories about why we didn't see Richard McGarry's name in the credits, which might be there and we didn't notice it. It's, okay, yeah, caveat. Uh, citation needed. But uh, let's 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 cue in on this and say that his <laughs> name isn't there because Zemeckis didn't want to pay him. Um, oh, that'd be a tough... That wouldn't hold up in court because it lifts dialogue directly from the comic. Yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> we'll see how that plays out. Yeah. Maybe if you're listening out um, there, Richard McGuire, if you're listening, yeah. write in and tell us. So this movie, to me, was a big nay, of course. I think it, that's not obvious so far. Um, it just screams hubris. It's really like, this is the team. We yeah. think we can do this. And, you know, Zemeckis is a tech guy. He's, he's all about movie-making technology. He was the one that got us, you know... Forrest Gump was incredible, incredible when it came out. Those scenes where he meets JFK and stuff, and he was really doing kind of blew you away. Everyone was talking in about contact. It. He was doing similar stuff with like CGIing. I think um, like uh, Bill Clinton into scenes and stuff. You know when they've got the alien announcements about alien stuff. So he's the guy that does this kind of. He's at the forefront of this kind of stuff, and he's like. He, I'm seeing him looking. Somebody's brought him this idea. Let's make a movie this, and I can see the wheels turning. He's like, I can use the tech to s do this. I can have characters fade into a frame, into a scene that's already on screen and stuff like this. I imagine, yeah, he got he 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 thought people will come and see my movie that's shot from a single POV. But the thing is, it's been done. Yeah. Every film student probably thinks, what if I don't move the camera? You know, it's it's basically a play. Yeah. Plays have been around since. <laughs> Ancient Greece. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, yeah, it's, uh, I, so I see what you're saying. He probably got caught up with the technical aspect yeah. of it and just called up Eric Stoltz yeah. and said, Eric Rolf. Stoltz, <laughs> Eric Stoltz <laughs> called up Eric Rolf and said, can you staple together these pages from this comic yeah. to make a few narratives that I can string alongside one yeah. another for an hour and a half? Bam. But it, the arrogance, because it's just, it's dull. Yeah. It's dull. It's boring. It's so prosaic. Well, prosaic's not quite the word, because if it were prosaic, it would be perhaps better. It's so of a certain... Like, it's also of Zemeckis' generation. Right. This this story we see. I had kids young. Oh, I've got to go work at a... I've got to wear a... Put on a suit and tie and sell stuff. Mm. I live in my parents' house. My son... My brother's going off to Vietnam. Mm. <laughs> oh, boy, I might have to pay capital tank gains tax when my parents leave me their house. I was amazed at that line. What a problem! Did. Yeah. Oh, I can only afford to go to Paris once a year. Yeah. Now that I'm retired, like fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Inf Ugh. Yeah. Nay for me too. 
Yeah, okay, adaptation. So there are some there are some lines from here in this movie. The first five seconds, as I mentioned, does seem like it's going to play out in a way that's clever, like the comic. Um, but he seems to have missed the point. The point that both of us both of us had different takeaways from the comic. He didn't get either of those. No. He just saw a storytelling strategy. Yep, or a way to do scene transitions. Yes. Like there's yes, nothing exactly. new about telling parallel stories. No. At different points in time. That's kind of like what the novel does. No. And here, the whole time I was thinking about Harold Pinter's The Betrayal. We talked about Pinter two weeks ago in that terrible Modesty Blade movie he wrote. <laughs> we did. But The Betrayal is that story that that uh, couple whose relationship breaks down after there's an affair and it's told in reverse. And yeah. that's what this movie needed to find something like that with these snippets of time. It should have been more out of order. I, you know, as soon as you sit down in your cinema seat, you're like, how can they have a scene that's only one shot long or that's like one second long? They can't do it. No. They're going to start having these long scenes. No, it was always going to have... Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I mean, he, if you're going to make a film of here, you got two choices. It can be utterly incomprehensible. A six-minute student short. Yep. Or it's going to be... It's going to have narratives. Yes, exactly. And you're all going to have to change it. Yeah. Now... I suppose if this were the only adaptation of here, I might be more forgiving. Yeah. But the thing is, he's been adapted a lot. Yeah. There's that student film we mentioned. There's the e-book yeah. we mentioned. It's been made into a museum exhibition. Right. Uh, he, it, in a sense, Maguire adapted it himself into a 300-page book. Exactly. Uh, it's been incorporated into other things. There was, a, I think, a photographic exhibit about the history of buildings. Yeah. And someone just said, I could put here in this. And yes. it could tell people something about the life, the life cycle of a building. Yes. You know, incorporating into a completely unrelated exhibition. You know, this has been successfully adapted, I think, in a couple of different ways. So, and all Zemeckis has done is said, I'm going to have my one POV film. Yes. <laughs> and people will come see it. Yeah. People will be enthralled by my vision. <laughs> Yeah. No. 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 I want to say. I just want to add. There were some moments in the movie that were taken from the short comic, not the long comic. But I can't remember what they are. And uh, oh, I missed those too. I might have written them down in my notes, but they're illegible, as I mentioned before. I'd be interested to check out the ebook. You know, I quite like. Um, if you do you know the the speculative fiction author Roger Zelazny who wrote yeah, Lord of Light? Yeah. yeah. So he wrote a book called Road Marks. Okay. Uh, and he, it's. Sort of an exercise in non-linear storytelling. He has par chapters that run in sequence. So there'll be a narrative that runs through every second chapter. Yeah. And every other chapter is a story that doesn't... That could happen at any point. Yeah. Because the book is about time travel. Yes. It's about a road you can move along okay. all through history. Okay. Now, allegedly, what Zelazny did was he shuffled those chapters, the non-linear ones, oh. and submitted them to his publisher... In a random order. Oh, okay. His publisher then went in and changed oh, the order into okay. a one that they thought was a little made a little more sense to the reader. Okay. So it wasn't Zelazny's original vision. But ever since then, I've thought to myself, I wish you could get an ebook of Roadmarks where it randomly ordered those right. second chapters. <laughs> right. And you could experience a different version of it every time. Something else just occurred to me. I just thought of Zemeckis's Back to the Future Part 2, yeah. which reframes the times you've already been in when Marty goes back to the same times like the Under the Sea dance. And yeah. there's that was such a great moment in that movie, and there's nothing like that no. here, where a there's scene is reframed <laughs> based on something that happens in the past or the future. No, it's very, it's very kind of like straightforward. Yeah. A necklace gets buried in one scene. It gets dug up in the next. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Nay. Nay. Uh, okay, the last thing I'm going to say is, uh, I'm going to, for the end music this week, I'm going to use the Liquid Liquid song Cavern. <laughs> which By Richard McGuire. By Richard McGuire, because you will recognize that bass line. Now, I don't know how much this guy makes, money he makes with his experimental art, but I bet he made a lot of movie, muse, money with his bass line, because you've heard it a million times in your life. Uh, okay, so... Uh, please remember to like, rate, review, subscribe. Yep. Um, please join us on Facebook and Instagram, which are they're getting quieter and quieter. <laughs> um, but you can use those places to comment uh, yeah. or you know DM us, we'll or even on Twitter. I'm still on Twitter. I still have a Twitter account. You can DM me there. 
Uh, you can email us. Uh, the email address is in the show notes. Uh, please join our Patreon at patreon.com slash comic book movie oblivion. If you want us to go see more movies when they come out and use our <laughs> LED pens to take notes. <laughs> Infuriating everyone around us. I had to buy the LED pens and the movie tickets, people, so we we need those bucks. So please sign up. I'm sorry there's still no rewards for being a Patreon <laughs> patron, um, except for many more fine episodes like this one. Okay, next week we just had... Yesterday, Kazuo Umezu passed away, so we are going to do the 1986 or 87 film version of The Drifting Classroom, yeah. um, which I don't know if I need to set it up much. It was on, you might be able to find it on YouTube, it was on Archive, and I started to know some, some of Archive is starting to come back, so you might be able to find it with there. It's almost every version I've found does have English subtitles, and a lot of the dialogue is in English for some reason. Brilliant. I'm not sure why. Um, well, perhaps we will discover it. Yeah, it was directed by uh, Obayashi, who directed Haosu. So um, we'll talk about that a little bit next week. But if you oh, haven't yeah. seen that, I recommend you watch.